But one big thing was you were on 21 Jump Street. Oh, yeah. And that was a big show. It, it was. It was my favorite. It was, it was watershed work for me because I was always taking these penny ante parts, the ones I could get with my long hair or whatever. Yeah. I got this part that was like tailor made for me, and I, I, I he was just a crack dealing gun toting. You know. I mean, bro, he played an essay like even these essay pages they play. Like, you know, when Johnny won, like it was cra these fucking crazy pages. I start finding real old, like obscure, you know, Depp rolls, and I remember like. Um, we'll get in that in a second. I wore, I wore my boy's troop jacket. I brought my corduroy Fila hat. I brought all my stuff. You know, I, so you'll laugh at this. They didn't have, you know, once again, I didn't wear shoes then, but I knew the shoes I wanted to wear. So I was like, listen, you got to get me big, um, you know, high tops. They're in Canada. They, we filmed it in Canada. They came with these, like, thin little Converse, these oh, sorry man. ass. And so the one thing that's not right is the shoes in it. Because the funniest thing is I didn't have any shoes then. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. Wearing socks, I guess, so, has its disadvantages. This is the only part that's deep in the hobby. For, I, have all, I have so many people from the hobby that listen to this show. This dude never stopped. Like, this motherfucker was collecting starting lineups. He was always in it. So I went to Beverly Hills Baseball Card Shop on Robertson Boulevard and that dude, bought that dude was I, that, that fuck was, that guy he but, was rough but I dude, bought that dude I bought a Oscar De La Hoya signed glove I remember it, that and Depp was like holy shit like damn you know because De, De La Hoya was the biggest boxer at the time I remember that and then I have like that. yeah so and then I have like that. yeah so we're just you know random talks that you know um obviously why the fuck would I ever know Johnny Depp except for you everyone knew that house was his behind the in front of the standard you know whatever and you know, all this shit. He owns the whole street now. So tell me about your relationships with, like, these megastars. Like, he's that type of dude. And Johnny, I had known Johnny because I was having a carnal knowledge with a young woman who was in this movie that no one talks about of Johnny's called Private Resort. Rob Morrow is also in it. Hector Elizondo. It's actually kind of funny. I was with the girl who was the lead. I'm at her apartment in, like, Mar Vista in some shithole. And, <laughs> and there's these pictures on the ground. And I'm like, who's that? She's like, that's Johnny Depp. I'm like, Johnny, what? And he, like, was beautiful, you know. Oh, he was just like, was I handsome, was like, man. and I hated on beautiful people because I was, yeah. you know, so <laughs> Jewish. And so uh, uh, later, you know, because I was also in the music scene, he moved out here with a band. He was a rocker. He lived right. in the Fontenoy in Hollywood with Nick Cage. He was a rocker. He was out here with right. a band. So I, and, like, sometimes I would see him in Hollywood. Who's that guy? And then I got thrashed in that skateboarding movie, and one of the girls in it was Cheryl and Fenn, whose brother Leo did the club at where we did Granville. It was all kind of connects. And, and remember, she walked up and got the job, and we were all kind of standing in the street at the casting office, and who's that? Oh, that's Leo Fenn's sister. Oh, really? Who's she? Oh, she's with Johnny Depp. And I was like, ding, ding, okay, this guy, clocking this guy again. And then, you know, we, like... Halfway would like cool guy look at each other in circles, whatever. Net we weren't friends. We just I know that dude. I know that dude. Whatever. And then I heard he got the show, and then I saw him one day outside of a club with one of his buddies. And was I wasn't in the nightclub business yet, but like I knew everyone. So I was like, I walked up to him. I was like, Hey, bro, congratulations. He was like, Ugh. You know, he he was grateful for the money and the opportunity because you know this was a guy that had come from dirt, and so he was grateful. But like he knew. It was a little corny. He was never, like, thinking it was the coolest thing in the world. You know, he was grateful, but, like, I got the vibe. And he was like, oh, thanks, man. Yeah, I was just, you know, up in Vancouver. It's like, you know, outpost up there. Got him in the club. And then and then, literally not months later, I auditioned and got the show for that role we were talking about. So I went up to Vancouver, and I'm like, well, this dude is either going to be real cool or he's going to be a dick. And sure enough, when he saw me, he was it was like we were old friends because he was just stuck up there in Canada and miserable. So big hugs, big love. And the, the, I think what cemented it, too, besides the fact that we just hung so hard, was that I had a demo tape from the hottest band on the planet. And we got in the van and drove away from the set. And I said, I got to play you something. This is the hottest shit is going to be the biggest shit there is. And I dropped in the Guns N' Roses demo tape. Oh, wow. And he, and he was blown away. Holy and, shit. And dude. so and I still have that tape, by the way. Of course I do. So, you know, I did the show. They realized that, oh, shit. Well, we're happy that Johnny's happy, but these two are gone. We're not going to be able to control <laughs> these two. And then two, a week later, I did the show, flew home. They wrote me a sequel episode. I was up there a week later, like, to do another show that nice. was, and that was dope. And then, he, and then two years later, I did like one of the great episodes of all time, where I was like a juvie on death row. And by that time, we were just locked. You know, we're like Gemini brothers, and he, it's always been like that. I think honestly, and I know this is like taking a, a different turn. My mom died when I was young, and my dad died when I was pretty young too. And when I first went up and did the show, my dad had just died maybe two months before, and uh, 
I had just gone through a little fake heartbreak and like he was miserable breaking up with Cheryl Lynn and we just bonded. And I think, I think these type of relationships, you know, with Bob Downey, I mean, I always say that Bob was in our circle, you know, him and Anthony Michael Hall were fucking with Rick and like they, he, Bob was in my circle. No, and, for and, sure. and from the day that we met, we were just like two kindred spirits. And so let's get to some Wagyu. Right, let's get to some motherfucker. Let's get to the fucking A5, right? We never even touched on our sports shit either. Oh, no, that's, that's a whole nother, that's, that's part two, Great. You know, whatever. Great. But bro, how do you feel about this verdict that just happened last week <laughs> with the Amber Heard defamation trial? Oh my gosh, Ben. Um, I've just got back from London. Um, <laughs> you know, he's my family, Johnny. And if anyone who's ever met him knows, like it's the stuff that was being said is not even possible. Like it's just not, it's like, if you know him at all, you know, it's not possible. People don't just start becoming like that in their fifties. There's no record of it. There's no woman out there has ever said anything like that about him. It was crazy, but you know, she was rotten from the start. That being said, if you're asking me, the question is, how do I feel about the verdict? Well, you know, I feel it's a goddamn victory lap and you know, I got a ring. <laughs> this is major. Like, you know, I'm so intrinsically connected and involved and like we cried and we, laughed and you know he i was there for the first week of the trial i was also there obviously for the six years where the media wouldn't cover anything on his side there's been a lot of crazy big names out there people trying to keep this down everyone wanted to kill him and step up on his big dead body and it didn't work like a phoenix from the ashes he rose up and stood up for himself and you know he's changed the world with this and people think that that's corny to say but he has changed the world by being the only person that could shoulder this load and stand up so when that and for men for men, for and men. for men but people say oh this is bad for women no it's not it's bad for her she's bad for women so there it is so here's the thing right here's the thing to go through it all you know and there was a guy called adam waldman people probably heard his name during the trial he's a lawyer he built that case and he he developed those witnesses and he got those tapes out you know he was really the an unsung hero i always joked that like adam's number three in the call sheet of this whole thing and you know being close to adam and going through the uk trial which was completely corrupt you know, I really also had an encyclopedic knowledge of the evidence and people that I never met and people that I didn't know, but what they meant to the case. And I was living and breathing it, you know, for six years, but it was hard because he took a lot of L's. And so as this happened, I think an interesting thing, some, you know, is that when Johnny hit the stand, first of all, he was so glad, you know, he wanted it televised. Because right. nobody would put this story out. Nobody. Yeah. They would jump on her story in a second. But nobody would put the real truths out there. So by having it televised every, or having it streamed, everybody could see it. Anyone who was interested could see it. Some people are like, oh, this is old news. Who cares? Well, very quickly, especially when he got on the stand, and then in week three when she got on the stand and gave the single oh, worst man. performance in the history of bad acting, and she sunk herself. So, you know, we started to feel it change. Now, people talk about the social media and the way the world supports him. What they did didn't know is for six years that was building itself and that's built not just by fans which the people try to debase it by saying oh it's fans no these are women these are men these are dv survivors these are people that were like there's no way this is true and there was so much facts and so much terminology and real evidence and testimonials that were put out there in the world over those six years that a lot of people knew what was going to transpire in this trial just hoping that it would stick properly with the jurors and it did because you know has, have you or anyone ever seen Johnny Depp talk like that? No. no. You've seen him on Letterman for two minutes. You've seen him tugging at his ears and, like, you know, making jokes. But, like, no one's seen him like that. He doesn't – he's not press hungry. He never does that stuff. No. So there he is talking like that. Even, even if it even felt weird to me. How about this motherfucker did a Christopher Walken impression of your – dog dying you know what i'm saying like come on bro that's like that's literally one of one in a million billion like he was doing walking before everyone did he? but yeah. he did such a good fuck i was like i was like wait what the because that's johnny doing i was i was like holy shit you know so he goes up there on trial then th week three she goes up and i thought this dumbass i thought she was gonna deliver a better performance i was nervous like she could go up there and maybe she could sell people on it but yeah. she was so bad and then that idiot acting teacher of hers gets up there and says as a witness oh well when she's acting she can't cry well doing, doing, doing. obviously she just went up there for a week and couldn't cry so she was obviously acting but yeah it was just it was pathetic but bro your attorney at a case this big look i've been sued you know i've had litigation like bro you don't be like, yo, bitch, like, you need to get your shit on point. And Dude, the biggest, no. and you couldn't? Well, we had seen her also. She had given depositions in 2016 for their divorce. She had so many different accounts of her nonsense. And, you know, 
I had hoped she would go up there and do herself in, but man, I couldn't imagine that she would do herself in as badly as she did. It was joyous. And the tide was changing. And now the world is growing and they're even trying to blame it on social media. It's like, don't, no, no, no. Don't blame anything on social media. The jury don't, has no access to that. Yeah, don't, don't. Do, and you know what? The jury was definitely landslid you and there's a reason why. Yeah. From the times I've met Johnny, the few times I've met him, right? Um, he always seems super chill, of course, you know, whatever. He's, you know, calm. And again, anyone could be, you know, have an off night after drinking or whatever. Even me, I don't drink like that. But, you know, whatever. It's like I don't trust people off these incidents. Right? I don't trust numbers. I don't trust. Uh, I trust patterns, though. Okay. And prior to this, Johnny got into some legal drama, right, before all this, right? And he won those two. Why was this so different? What do you mean? I mean, he got into lawsuits before, right? Well, here's, here's what happened. When, when I think what happened is there was a whole little back channeling out here. A lot of these lawyers out here and these managers and these agents, a lot of people, even in the biggest stakes, they, they're all, this, these, are, these are big money games here. This guy's a big money cottage industry himself. So I think there was a lot of people in cahoots. And I think at some point when all this was going down, he, he found out that same lawyer, Adam Waldman, Killed the business manager. He also testified that guy. He got blasted. He killed the business manager, killed the lawyer, this guy called Jake Bloom, who had to end his firm and start a new one after this because these guys were up there robbing and they got in with the divorce lawyers. Everybody was robbing. Everyone had their hand in the cookie jar. And I guess along with her, they didn't think he'd fight back. They thought he was a patsy and they were wrong. Damn. They were very, very wrong. Damn, that was a bad bet. That was a bad bet. So, um... How many times have you, have you interacted with Amber? Like you met her before and everything? Well, of course. I mean, she was my, my dear friend of 35 years, his wife. I was at that rotten wedding. You know, I, interestingly enough, I never heard ever anyone have a good word to say about her. That's for real. And so that's crazy. before, and that's directors that we know, actors that we know. And before, when he got with her, or was kind of like whatever, hanging out with her, people were telling me like, dude, your boy's got to look out. That girl's rotten, da, da, da. And so... So wait, hold on. Did you know from the jump that she was bad, like a bad person? She was bad news? Anyone who ever brought her up to me, knowing that he was like, had made a movie with her and was now kind of messing with her, was like, dude, tell your boy to run. And I'm not going to out those friends of ours that tell me, I'm talking about big directors, real actors, people saying, tell, you know, Steve Bing, God rest his soul. He was very close with her, that wife of hers that she domestically assaulted back in 09 or whatever. He was close with her and Steve was telling me, Steve was like, dude, she's rotten. Guys, Steve Bing, billionaire, amazing dude, had a kid with Elizabeth Hurley. I brought him up on the show before. Legend. G. G. Fucking legend. Nicest guy. I got to meet him randomly through someone who also knows Josh, my brother-in-law, my sister's husband, Scott, who work with Guns N' Roses and everything else so random. But yeah, but fucking... I'm Jumped out of 27th floor window in COVID. <laughs> I mean, it's scary, sad, poor guy. I, I was with him a month before. I couldn't believe it. Are you serious? Steve, wow. Steve Bing, yeah. Anyway, so I had heard all this terrible stuff. And then here's what happened. This was the clincher. And this is the, this is the moment I meet this chick. Um, it's the premier party for Rum Diaries, and it's going to be in a bungalow. The post party is going to be in a bungalow at the Chateau. And so I was with Frankie, my dear friend, business partner, um, friend of Ben's, neighbor of Ben's, kids go to school together. And Frankie, who's, you know, another gadfly in this town, knows everybody. He was saying, oh, you're going to meet my homegirl. I go, what? He goes, yeah, you know, I used to, I was like hanging out with her a little bit. I go, really? And he goes, yeah, but then one day she took me out to lunch and uh, told me she was a lesbian <laughs> and kind of iced it off. And we stayed friends or whatever, but, you know, just, just tell her hey for me i'm like okay so i'm like i already don't like this girl and i'm gonna have this is like a, a decent way to weigh in it so I, i'm at the party i'm i hey johnny introduced me to her and i said oh so you know i just want to tell you uh frankie says hi she looked at me kind of puzzled and i said you know you know my partner frankie delgado he just wanted to send his best glad to know you're doing good and she looked me dead in my face like i don't know who that is Oh, and God, I was like, I oh, it. this lion ass. This, I could, <sighs> like, you're gonna lie to my face? I'm like, so, and the funniest thing, people always ask, you know, did he know? And I was like, he kind of did know because people did not pull strings around him. He, she yeah. says he's surrounded by a bunch of sycophants, but he's not. And people would say their displeasure with things. So that was hard. The wedding was even more brutal <laughs> because I knew, I, I knew he didn't want to marry her, but like, he always knew. It, he always knew. 
that she was going to be up to something like this. He always knew it, and there's stories about it. I actually gave legal statements about it. So it, it, ultimately, that's a lot of negativity, but the positivity is, is after six years of this burden and the world turning on him and the business turning on him, after six years, it's a huge victory. And he's, by the way, he's on tour with Jeff Beck. He's, he's, he's living his best life in all honesty. No, and, and, and he's chill. Videos. He's yeah. chill also. He wasn't, we were all bugging out surrounding him way more when this was going on. He's like been really even keeled about it. He's just been through so much, you know? No, I mean, and he did an amazing job, right? And you just said the word turning three times, right? What were the turning points in the trial? Like, how did you see the tides change Right before your eyes. Well, I think we, I just said it. I, I really saw it. I was there the first week. It was very tense because nobody really knew. He had taken nothing but a bunch of L's. So, you know, he, not, not a bunch of L's, but like the UK trial, which he wasn't suing her in the UK. He was suing a newspaper, RAG newspaper, um, and she was the witness. So a lot of the stuff that got into this trial didn't get into that trial. And the judge was definitely compromised and blah, blah, blah. I know I sound like a conspiracy guy, but <laughs> point is it's all, it's all factual. He retired one nanosecond after and... uh I hope I see him one day. But this had been a rough ride. People, everyone was like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? You know, And it's not to skirt your question about the tides, because I think I said that about when she testified and when he testified is when it really turned. You saw it, right? Yeah, but so the interesting thing is that, was that he's always been a big-time guy with Make-A-Wish, and he's got fans all... I mean, he's, he's like Michael Jordan, Muhammad Ali, Michael Jackson famous. He is. Like Bob Downey, who's a, the biggest beast of all, can walk to Cross Creek by himself and does. Johnny, because of his, his hats and his scarves and his knickknacks, like it's, you know, he, he no, just can't go sure, anywhere. No. No, and he, I, and I, he I, never really could. And, and without a Marvel movie, he could do this. You know what I'm saying? Oh, like yeah. It's just yeah. And so, you know, he's so beloved for 35 years in the public trust on all ends of the world that like... I think that his big thing was like, I just, I can't, I can't, because big, you know, Guy O'Siri, Ron Burkle, Steve Bing, everybody was like, just let it blow over. Don't put yourself through this. Don't do this. And to give Guy O'Siri big love, he called right after it happened and said, hey, you didn't, I'm glad you didn't listen to my advice. You were right. I wow. was wrong. It was really, it was beautiful. Anyway, and, and I know Johnny was super touched by that. So we, it was a lot of big people telling him, dude, don't, don't, go, don't, don't, don't do, put yourself yeah, to this. Don't, okay. and, 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 you know, he just was like, I can't have every little kid that I met or my own children for that matter, which he said a lot in the trial. I, I just can't have people thinking this is true about me. I know I'm going to get put through hell, but like, I can't do it. I can't let that go down. I can't let someone get away with that, you know, and he didn't. And sit down. You lost. Good for him, dude. Let's talk about, like, you know, what was, like, I mean, you know, you were, you were out there. I remember you were like, like, oh, I'm here, boom. And not that I know. Like, it took me being out there just a few days ago. I was in Tyson's for four and a half days, four nights, and you didn't fucking know, whatever, boom. And I'm just thinking, like, okay, you were chilling there. I was like, what not, are you doing? Yeah. I was just there, Ben. No just random, there. right? You know, like, dude, like, you guys were cooped up. He's cooped up in fucking Tyson's, right, in, in our favorite hotel. And uh, it was funny because I was going to go eat at the Palm. Right, because it's the week. fanciest hotel, but you know, room, but I mean, fanciest restaurant. Sorry, but I like Randy's a little better, and but it's like more like not as private as the Palm is, right? Uh, I like the steak and Randy's better, but what was Johnny's mentals like? Well, like, what, what, how was he Dude, like? It's he was crazy. There? I was just kind of touching on it, you know. While we're all tripping, he is super even keeled. He was, you know, he's remember he's been saying this stuff. No, but during the trial, he was ke even yeah, killed he, then? No, I'm not going to lie. There was a, definitely that first week, and there, there was a lot of emotions. There's a lot of backfighting. Everyone thinks all things all rosy-rosy with everybody and the lawyers, but it's not. Like, there's fighting. There's, you know, we had to have that one bitch thrown out of the court for handing off fake stuff. You know, like, it was tense, but I will say, for what he had been through and what was weighing on his shoulders, he was remarkably even killed. Even when he was playing the Royal Albert Hall with Jeff Beck, just like May 30, May 31, he... Everyone's bugging. They're about to come back. The jury's deliberating. And he's just, he's kind of having the time of his life. He feel, he, I think he felt like, listen, I got it out there. I needed everyone to see. If they get it, cool. If they don't, cool. But I know it's out there now. It's The genie's out of the bag and you can't hide it. I call this wave of his, it's called like the global tsunami of people out there in the world. And I, his, so his temperature like that night when we did a celebratory dinner, Friday, May 27th, that was closing arguments when she got battle-axed again. She just couldn't sit down. He went back up, so she's like, she had to go back up, and she just got, she just got battle-axed again. Where'd you, guys, where'd you guys have dinner at? The Palm. <laughs> so so we go to the private room and had a real, and uh, Johnny's manager, Jack Wiggum, he took us to a fantastic dinner, and it was, it was, 
you know, he FaceTimed with my son and Christina, like, you know, he was really chill and really enjoying himself. That's he dope, he was really unburdened. And this is pre-verdict. It was really unburdened. And it was a beautiful feeling, honestly, and a great day. It's not weird, bro. Does he eat steak? What, what does John eat? Does he eat a lobster? What the well, fuck? If you, you know him, he's not known for <laughs> eating a lot. But lately, he's been eating more. He ate pasta that night, drank the, the Jack bought us tons of great wine and oh um, they got by the way they got a great linguine and clams at uh, it's famous at the palm it's is fucking, it it's good i don't do linguine and clams but we did we he ate he ate we didn't he didn't eat steak that night i did i served and turfed and it was fantastic actually <laughs> nice nice let's talk about some weirdos from jd's past right like i've known some of them right like the crazy thing is sal Jenko, like bro you introduced me to him i dj at viper room a few times right i kicked it there here Dude, this guy, you would leave me at your house. You would be gone. I don't, maybe six, seven hours, and I would be at the house with Sal, chilling with like my ex girlfriend's like kids, kicking it. And like, then I would go to Sal and hang out, and we would go kick it. And like, he would take me to go get pizza and shit. Like, what the fuck is it with? And that's an OG homie of, of Johnny's, right? I think a lot of people, you included myself, People want to be surrounded by the people that they trust the most, right? So when Johnny got the TV show in Canada, he had his buddy that he grew up with in Florida uh, out there, and he became the janitor on the TV show. They created a part for him because Johnny was like, I'm stuck up here. I'm going to have my boy up here. Right. And then after that, you know, the show was probably, what, 86, 87, 88, 89. Then Viper Room got, happened in uh, August of 93, right after the Hard Rock Vegas Open, which was an unbelievable weekend, if you remember. Unbelievable. And then uh, um, Sal was to run it, you know? It made sense. I mean, Johnny's not going to run the club he picks his friend he thought he could trust and you know and sal by the way did a great job for a really long time i mean he was the he was the face of the club and 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 i think just over time you know wasn't he even in the band he tried to have a band there for a minute called colon hole i mean you know it was a lot of people that are in the hemisphere of really really famous people sometimes it gets to him and i think that sal just i i don't know I, i think he had a midlife crisis and whatever happened essentially the club got lost. Like, but still, wasn't Sal very well taken care of? Like, why go and fuck? Like, I, I, I I'm not gonna sit here and say what he did or didn't do. Right, I'm just gonna right. say that on his okay. on his watch, the club got lost. Right. And and you know, Johnny's a loyal guy, and and I think it was just it was a lot to take. You know, I think he trusts people a lot, and look what happened: business managers robbed him, lawyers robbed him. Oh, you know, everybody. You know, and if, if you don't stay on top of your stuff, that's going to happen. So ultimately, when you ask about Sal Jenko, who was a very mythical character in town for about ten years, um, I, I, I hear he's okay. I think he has a kid that's probably getting up near late teens and i think he's all right um i don't know you know because he's, he's not in our world anymore so i don't know yeah i just think like you know you're big on loyalty you're big i mean you you at least accept the new people you know you have to you're, you're you know you might run a new club new restaurant new something and you have cool people around so you know you and frankie have newer guys but i can see like someone like him he's like gonna have he's just only ogs around him you know what i mean bob same thing keanu same thing but like you know i'm just like i don't know i'm still dumbfounded by that whole Sal shit. Sometimes people just get drunk on the on the thing, you know, like I think Sal got to the point where maybe he thought he was bigger than the than what made him, than what wouldn't put him there. I don't know what happened to him because because it did get bad. I mean, the club was losing a lot of money. There was a lot of excess going on. I remember we'd be si- no, no. we'd be sitting in that office, which was like everyone rolled into that office, yeah, yeah, right? Of we'd be sitting in that little office. And he'd be like, you want Tana's right now? And he would like, call Dan Tana's up. Like, he was just living yeah. the life, but whatever it was, the profitability and or even just the the status quo of the club got lost. And there's a crazy story about the Viper Room that people don't talk about. When Johnny bought it, it was a place called The Central. Prior to that, it was Filthy McNasty's in the 70s. And uh, and that whole block's about to get torn down, by the way. Anyway, there was a guy that was like a silent partner, some guy called Tony something. And they used to keep his picture by the cashier. So in case he came, he got taken care of. Never really came. And when he would come, he would come and like have a soda and leave. But he had to be left on the operating of the business. Nobody knows the story. Well, I mean, some people, but like, it's not known, known. And something happened where he disappeared and people tried to like implicate things like maybe Sal, I don't know, people, there was all these weird stories, but this guy at one point disappeared. And 
there was so much weird backstory to that club and this mythical place and poor River Phoenix dying there and just all the, you know, Johnny and I were just talking about this, by the way, literally just talking about this when I was out with him at the trial and then on tour in England, we were talking about, you know, Tom Petty opening night and then like, the Black Crows got up. Like every night, somebody with Lenny Kravitz, every night in those first few months, somebody got up. They're like, because that was the idea of it. While right. Johnny was there, people were just going to come and get up and play. Fuck, I forgot. About, I just remember now. And the Johnny Cash show, which well, was like. Dude, how about this? I went to you. I was like, I was like, what'd you just say? You said, um, it's the king of rock and roll. I was like, you mean Elvis? And you're like, no, motherfucker, come to this show. The first and the only time I've ever seen the dude, and I was ready to leave after like five minutes, and you're like, Yo. And you know who my plus one was? Was Danny Boy, and he was the same. He was ready to leave, too. Yeah. You two hip-hop motherfuckers couldn't handle this hardness. But the funny thing was, outside that club one night, I forgot what it was. Was it Chris Farley? But you told somebody that, oh, no, that no. <laughs> Mark McGrath was Ethan Hawke. What, what, it was, was Chris it? Farley, that's right. Oh, and that God. was right before Chris Farley died. And Chris was hammered. It wasn't that night. It was a different night. But I'm standing outside with Mark McGrath, who looked exactly like Ethan Hawke he when he was young. And I was, and Chris was like, Chris was around those days, wasted. He's like, hey, man, what's up? I go, Chris, have you met Ethan? Oh, hey, Ethan. And Chris Farley went and grabbed his girlfriend. I was like, babe, babe, got to meet Ethan. And then, like, he was dead, like, literally within six months. Jesus Christ. The big thing I want to end about any of this Johnny talk right now is one thing that I was telling my wife was, if any ex-girlfriend went up on a trial for me, uh, I'm getting cooked. Like, I'm getting fucking destroyed from any fucking ex. I don't give a fuck. Like, I, there, there's very, I mean, maybe one might say some good things. And, like, I had an eighth grade girlfriend that got me out of trouble because she's a DA now in L.A. She's an actual district attorney. But when Kate Moss went up and, that was like, so dope. she sealed God. the fucking thing, bro, for her ex to go up there and co-sign you like that. Well, she's also insanely press shy. Kate does, Kate's like a Johnny type. She doesn't seek press. She I've doesn't talk. Press, yeah. And you know, it's funny. You want to know why that happened? That happened because that dumbass went up there and threw her name out there. She loves Johnny and obviously, you know, but Johnny never would have asked her to do that. Never. She came out and said, I'm doing this. She put my name out there and my little 16 year old goddaughter's asking me, did Johnny Depp throw me down the stairs? And she's like, she was so pissed off. And so Damn. That you know who has herself to blame for why Kate Moss came up there because she threw her name out there. Fuck, bro. So what do you think about this appeal? And like, you know, her, her attorney's like, she definitely cannot afford to pay this, blah, blah, whatever. Oh, but meanwhile, like. she had a $30,000 house she was renting the whole time with, yeah. all her, with all her fake friends in it. Right. Um, I don't know what to tell you, dude. I'm not going to get into all that craziness about who pays for her stuff. And I don't care about all that. And, and, and who, that, think- who that child of hers is fathered by. But at the end of the day, the words are out there and you all can check it out. Someone who makes rockets and cars. Um, do you think, though, that they're going to drag this on again with the appeal? Or do you think it's just going to get... I mean, what do you think? Good luck. Ball don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Appeals are way harder. All right, man. Appeals so, are so way harder. Enough of that. Look, man, I'm so glad that, you know, you... Um, you know, I remember when Frankie was telling me, he's like, dope, dude. I told Josh, man, you got to find a Mexican girl. You got to have a kid and just be chill. You got no trouble. You know, boom. You know, you had a kid late in life. And um, my boy, Russell Peters had a kid like at 52 and you know random things like 